everyone and welcome to today's webinar, an exciting webinar for us all. Uh, it's the last in our summer series, we'll be back in September, uh, but our last webinar series is the critical link between agent satisfaction and the customer experience. Uh, just want to run through the agenda for that. Uh, I'm John T. Pierce, I'm editor of the uh, Call Send Help, I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar. Delighted to be joined by Rob Wilkinson of Call Center Connect. Uh, Rob featured uh, very highly in our poll of the best respected people in the contact center world. And uh, Rob is going to take us through five ways to improve the customer experience, including a few tips that you can uh, probably implement within an hour of this webinar finishing. Uh, also, delighted to be joined by uh, Francis Carden from OpenSpam. Uh, Francis uh, has appeared on uh, one of our webinars a, a couple of years ago and uh, went down very well there. And uh, uh, Francis's presentation is about the critical link between agent satisfaction and the customer experience and particularly the role that uh, technology can help to play in that. We'll be doing top tips uh, from the audience. That's your chance to win uh, a bottle of champagne. Is uh, share is, is uh, hand over to Rob Wilkinson from uh, Call Center Connect, and Rob can take us through his presentation, uh, which is looking about five ways that we can improve the customer experience. So I've just changed the uh, baton across to Rob. Rob, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, put your slides up on the screen, please. Sure, thank you very much, John C, and um, hello, everyone. Um, a brief introduction. Um, uh, I am Rob Wilkinson, um, and I wanted to give you an, an idea as to maybe why I've been asked to um, impart some of my experience today. Um, I've worked in, in call centers for over 14 years uh, in a, a varying amount of different roles in different types of contact center environments. And for the last five years, I have been running my own company called Call Center Connect, which is um, uh, it's a, basically an agent level call center recruitment business that allows me to spend time with, so far, over 40 different call centers over the last five years. And um, that's given me quite a good insight into the various different types of operations and working practices of lots of different operations. Um, I was voted call center helpers fourth most respected person uh, of 2012. Uh, thanks to John T for pointing that out. It is absolutely my crowning glory. Um, and I'm also uh, ranked in the top 30 of customer service influencers on Twitter. Um, so uh, if you're interested in following me or whether that's Twitter or LinkedIn or anything, all my details are at the bottom of every slide. Um, but without further ado, I shall crack on and get down to the important stuff. Um, one point to add today is that your job, um, uh, from my presentation as far as I'm concerned, is that um, you, you, you might know some of the stuff I talk about, you might, um, you might not necessarily agree with some of it, um, but what I would challenge you to do is to try and find one or two nuggets of information that you can take away and use straight away in your call center. Uh, and that way you're getting value from um, hopefully my experience and, um, and that would be great if you could do that. So the things that I'm going to cover, um, I'm going to talk about um, what the voice of the customer uh, means to me. I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, uh, someone who uh, can demonstrate a really successful uh, approach of using a unified goal. Um, I'm going to talk about removing barriers. I'm going to discuss uh, developing leaders. And most importantly, I'm going to talk about agent satisfaction itself. Um, so voice of the customer, putting the customer at the heart of everything that we do. If you're going to improve the customer experience, there's one simple thing that you can't escape, and that is that you have to know what it is your customers want to experience. Otherwise, you're going to go and try and do things that you think they want, but you might not necessarily know for sure. Think about it. How much time, resources, and money do you spend every single month driving improvements, implementing changes, coaching and training your staff, all in the name of the customer experience? If you're spending all that time and money on something, shouldn't you be certain that it's the right something to be spending that time on? I'd hope you'd think that you do, and what I'd like to do is ask you to ask yourself a question, and what I want you to do is I want you to answer completely honestly. Don't worry, no one can hear you, you're on a webinar, you know, no one's sat next to you. Um, and the question that I want you to answer is, if your life depended on it, can you say with 100% confidence that you've asked, and more importantly listened, to exactly what your customers say they want from you? Because if you haven't, then a lot of the stuff that you're doing is probably a waste of time. So here are a couple of more questions that, um, that you can ask, and as well as the questions, I'm going to give you a few tests that you can take away. You can carry them out straight away at the end of this webinar to judge whether or not you really are putting the customer at the heart of everything you do. So first of all, I'm going to ask the question, um, does 
every member of your staff know precisely what it is that your customers have already told you they want from you. And to be sure about that, at the end of this webinar, why don't you go away and ask 10 agents at random what your customer wants from them? Because if they don't all give you the same answer, then you're not on the same page and, and you're not doing what you need to do. The second question is, does your call center monitoring make sure that what's being done by your teams is delivering on what your customers have already told you what they want from you and not just something that the company thinks that they want? And my tip for kind of figuring that out is listening into 10 positively scored calls. That's really important. Calls that have been listened to, monitored, and given a good score and ask, did the customers on those calls get what they've already told you they wanted to get? Because if they didn't, how, how, why were they positively scored? It's because the scoring is geared to something else and not necessarily directly what the customer wants. And finally, do the coaching sessions that your managers are carrying out every day, every month, um, or you if you are a manager, do they drive your people to give your customers what they've told you they already want? And um, if they have, then what does it mean to them and how they do their job? Once again, really easy to check and, and, and try this. So after the webinar, go and ask 10 agents at random uh, what the outcome of the last coaching session was. Uh, and let's see if they know what it was and let's see if they can tie it into um, the, uh, what the customer wants. So I'm going to leave you another little secret at this point. Um, it's okay if you're not already doing all of this. Uh, in fact, it's great if you're not already doing all of this because um, now you've got an amazing opportunity uh, to have a huge and positive impact on your customer experience. And to start with, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. It happens to be last year. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Ben Hunt Davis last year, it's this chap here, uh, at an event where he was the keynote speaker on driving business growth by focusing on the important stuff in your business. Ben competed at three Olympic Games uh, and eventually won an Olympic gold medal at the Sydney Olympics in uh, 2000. Now, Ben's failure, and that's his words, not mine, but Ben's failure to win a medal in the two earlier Olympics and um, how he used those lessons that he learned from those failures is a story that I've taken a lot from and I'm going to share with you today because I think we, we can all learn from them. So um, when putting together the team for Sydney 2000, he was the only member of that team remaining from the original team that first entered the Olympics eight years earlier. And he was in a really difficult mental place as a result because he was struggling with the baggage of these two failures um, to the degree that he nearly pulled out so as not to jinx the rest of the team. Uh, his coach and his mentor uh, fortunately, he was able to get him to turn all of this into really positive focus uh, by asking a few questions. And first of all, they said, you know, you know what, is it the team that isn't strong enough? Is that, is that why we've not won the last two times? And the answer to that was no. They asked themselves, was it that the team wasn't technically good enough? Um, and, and again, the answer was no. Uh, they asked the team, did they not want to win? You know, was the, you know, was the ambition not really there enough? No, that wasn't the case at all. And maybe the boat wasn't good enough, you know, the boat itself, let's blame our tools. Um, and of course they came back and they said no, because this is a professional, you know, these are Olympic uh, athletes, this, this is a team, these are people who've got money invested in them, and, you know, they're as good, if not better, than anybody else, they just hadn't happened to win. So they needed to do something different, and they decided, instead of focusing on all, the, all these little separate things, uh, they should even focus on just one thing, a unified goal. And this is my challenge to everybody and you should be doing this in your businesses. Um, they, they agreed that for two years leading up to that one single race, that every single thing that they did would only be done if they could prove that it would make the boat go faster. So the question that they asked was, will it make the boat go faster? And from everything down to the food they ate, the arguments they had about strategy, the types of exercises they did, to the amount of test races they'd compete in, all these things, um, they'd only ever do it after asking, will it make the boat go faster? It made things quite fun. And um, the outcome of this was that Ben and his team didn't just win in 2012, they, sorry, 2000, they absolutely trounced the competition. Uh, and they became the only British crew to win the same event since 1912. Um, that's like an, almost an entire century since, they, uh, since, since Britain had won it. So fantastic achievement. Uh, and for me, if it's good enough for an Olympian, it's good enough for me. Um, and you know, I'd hate to be accused of not practicing what I preach. So just to provide you with evidence, I, uh, I, I like to kind of um, deliver the same thing. And emblazoned on the walls of every office at CCC is uh, this, these words in large blue letters, which is my take on uh, Ben's Olympic mantra, which is, will it get or keep more customers? And that's to keep all my team focused on, on making sure that they're delivering to our customers all the time. So 
I want to ask you to imagine something now. Imagine taking the voice of the customer we were talking about earlier and turn that into your unified goal. Um, how powerful would that actually be? So um, one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to remove barriers if you're going to get people and their teams to deliver this unified goal. Um, but guess what? People are going to get in the way. It's a fact. And what you need to do is you need to accept very early on. Uh, you need to embrace it. You need to plan for it. And you, if you do, you can you can actually achieve an awful lot to minimise the impact that negativity and resistance to change can have. And it's all about these barriers. People who are resistant to change keep themselves in their comfort zones by surrounding themselves with these barriers. Reasons that they create that they genuinely believe means the rules don't apply to them, or that all this new stuff is just simply a bad idea. Um, the great news is that we know that they're wrong, don't we, right? Um, but the bad news is that the reason they're wrong is it's all your own fault. It's all our fault. Um, why is that? Well, because it's, it's our responsibility. We're responsible to give them the understanding that they need to embrace the ideas in the first place. We're responsible to get them engaged and get them to buy into the idea early on. We're responsible for getting them to identify and remove these barriers before you roll any changes out. Because if you don't do this, they won't feel like they own this change. They won't feel consulted, and they'll see it as management forcing them to do yet another new thing on top of everything else that they've got to do every single day. You know, it's no wonder, if that's the case, that they're, they're less than supportive when you try and do things. So whether it's red tape, uh, preventing things happening, you know, policy and, and you know, processes that have to be followed, whether it's uh, a lack of training or coaching or, or you know, skill set, um, or if it's a technical barrier, you know, overcomplicated systems uh, or, or too many call, if it, all these things, the great news is here is that it's, we have the power to have an impact on all of that and we can remove all of those barriers early on, overcome those objections before they're raised and get people to be a part of this whole process from the beginning. So uh, time for me to ask you to imagine something again and imagine taking the voice of the customer turning it into that unified goal, and then having no barriers in the way of making it all happen. How powerful would that be? I think now it's uh, actually time to go over for a poll, so I'm going to hand you back to John T now. Thank you very much. Hi, John T. Thank you much for that. Uh, the poll that we have is on a scale of one to five, how satisfied are you with, uh, how, sorry, how satisfied are your contact center agents. So if you'd like to uh, vote on that, the scale of five is very satisfied, five is over the moon, four is generally good, three is okay but could do better, uh, two is poor but needs some improvement, and number one, uh, morale is at a rock bottom. So uh, if you'd just like to uh, vote on those, Rob, where do you think uh, things are likely to uh, to come, come through in, in, in this voting? Oh, good question. Uh, I think obviously a lot of different factors can, can influence that in terms of what type of operation it is and, and kind of what kind of um, company it is. But I think I'm going to be both an optimist and a realist, and I'm going to plump for number four, generally good. Okay. Well, let's have a look at uh, look at how the the voting. Uh, lots of people voted on this. Eighty percent of the uh, audience that share the uh, results up. Um, so, wow. Uh, okay, but could be could do better is by far the uh, largest. Um, what I think is really sad is that we don't have any votes at all that have voted over the moon, um, which is, uh, gosh, that's uh, that's sort of um, quite interesting. 29% um, generally good. Uh, luckily, hardly anyone has morale at a, a, a rock bottom, um, and 90% uh, uh, of the audience or need some improvements. I think um, I think certainly the topic of the webinar is uh, you know is is absolutely spot on. So Rob, uh, back to you. Thanks, John T. Uh, yeah, really interesting to see that actually. Um, and I think it will uh, a lot of it might depend on the kind of the level of role that people are in as to what their answers to that question might be. Which brings me kind of um, smoothly into my next part of the subject, which is about. Um, the the people who are um, taking care of our, our staff because um, the role of uh, team leader, team manager, or, or whatever you want to call them, um, is crucial uh, to the effective development and retention of the talented frontline agents that we've got in place. Those people who are looking after 
your customers every single day, day in, day out, and giving the customers what what it is that they want. Um, the people who support those teams are absolutely crucial. Um, and the effective development of the team leader or manager is therefore essential. So it often scares me um, that it's actually quite common for team leader development to be far less robust than it is for agent development. And, and I think that's because sometimes we, uh, we, we forget that they need the support, or sometimes it's um, assumed that they're OK uh, because of the roles that they, that they have. And unfortunately, uh, as is often the case, most, most people don't seem to understand what the difference is between simply managing and actually leading. Um, and that's why I'm saying develop leaders, because you need to have leaders in your business if you want to deliver an ex excellent world-class customer experience. Um, and you know what? If, if someone doesn't know the difference between managing and leading, then how, how can they make a difference? How can they become a leader? So I'd like to ask you, ask, ask you all another question, and, and, and that is, what is the difference between a leader and a manager? Um, you don't have to kind of enter into the chat already, and it's just something for you to, to consider. And, and while she's doing that, um, I'm going to talk you around what, what I think. Um, for me, the clue is in the title. Uh, it's the word manager. Personally, I think it's a horrible word. Um, at least it is if you kind of use it in other contexts. And just to give you one example of those, um, if someone that you knew had been made redundant and you were to say to them, how are you getting on after the, you know, after the redundancy? How are you going to cope? And they may well turn around and say, oh, you know, I'll manage. Uh, and for me, that, that pretty much sums it up as, as, as a negative word. You see, I believe there are three key differences is between managing and leading and to highlight them I've got three examples here so first of all uh, managing means getting by uh, whereas leading means taking people on a journey that they never thought possible um, imagine when they uh, Red Bull decided to get someone to jump out of space and then um, and, and jump to the, to the earth I don't think everybody would have just went oh yeah we can we can probably do it I think they needed to be leaded uh, to where they were going with that one um, Managing means doing the best with what you've got, whereas leading means being the best no matter what. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the Wolf, um, our, our, um, our, our Paralympic champion who popped up lots of medals last year, um, you know, never let the fact that he was uh, in a wheelchair get in his way. Um, and finally, managing means getting your team to deliver what it is that's asked of them, whereas leading them means inspiring that team to excel. I don't think for one minute that um, Steve Jobs built the iPad, um, but it was his, his vision and his creation and 30 years of experience that inspired and got his team to deliver something above and beyond what they probably ever set out to achieve and continue to make those improvements. And you know what? Why on earth would anybody want to spend a third of their life just managing to do something? How negative would that be? Well, if you or your team uh, have what I call the managing or manager's mindset, instead of the leader's mindset, then that's exactly what's going on. So I'd like you to imagine another thing now, and that is that if you could use the voice of the customer as your unified goal, have no barriers in the way of delivering that, and then get leaders in place to guarantee the success of it, how powerful could that be? And that brings me on to, uh, to my final um, part of this presentation, and that is agent satisfaction. Uh, these are the guys on the front line. It's tough on the front line, you know, handling the customers, looking after those customers every single day. But agent satisfaction um, is very different to employee engagement, which is often something that people get confused about. You see, employee engagement is a measurement. It's a measurement that actually is often carried out just after payday or around the Christmas party when everybody's really happy. And agent satisfaction is actually, for me, it's the holy grail. Um, your agents are your direct point of contact with your customers. They're the front line. They're the lifeblood of your business. And dissatisfied agents means dissatisfied customers. The good news is it's also vice versa. Now, I could bang on about the importance of recruiting the right agents in the first place, about how having the wrong people in the wrong job means that they'll never be satisfied. However, my company recruits agent level staff, and I'm not here to sell to you. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume we've all got the right people in the right jobs um, or working on it, and that we're going to look at what we need to do to ensure that they get and remain satisfied because you see like I say agent satisfaction isn't a measurement it's actually an environment and as with all environments it can be influenced by several really important factors first of all it's the tools if you don't provide your people with the tools they need to do their job then like a mechanic without a spanner they're going to get very frustrated very quickly next thing it's the skills 
if you don't train your staff properly, then like an athlete without a coach, they're never going to get on the podium. So why would they even start the race in the first place? Thirdly, it's support. And support is different to coaching and training. Support is the Formula One driver's pit lane. It's where he goes to refuel or to, to get a problem with the car fixed. And finally, it's about freedom. Everything else means nothing without freedom. Freedom is removing all the barriers we talked about earlier on. And a lack of freedom is like an artist with a lack of confidence. Someone who creates a masterpiece only to lock it away in their own safe. So imagine using the voice of the customer as your unified goal, having no barriers in the way, getting the leaders to guarantee its success, and then having agents who are happy and committed to achieving that goal in place. How powerful would that be? Well, that's it from me. Um, I hope that you've managed to take away a couple of nuggets, as I mentioned earlier on, that you can use today. Um, and it's time for me to uh, pack, pass you back to John T. Okay, Rob, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I particularly love the uh, three tests you can do today. Uh, which is ask 10 agents at random what your customers want from them, listen to 10 positively scored calls, and did the customers get what they want, and ask 10 agents what was their objective, uh, uh, sorry, what their objective was after the most recent coaching. So uh, be fascinated to find out if anyone does that and uh, what the results were. So if you want to drop a line to newsdesk at callcenterhelper.com, uh, we can have a, a quick look at that. Uh, so just a, a little bit of um, feedback from the uh, audience. Uh, the difference between uh, leadership and uh, management, Rob, uh, Daphne has said very much in line with what you said, a leader sees the big picture and can move people forward. Uh, managing, is re and managing is really keeping the status quo. Uh, an interesting comment in from uh, Malu, who said, I find huge variations in agent satisfaction, uh, particularly g generally students working part-time are performing best, they're most engaged and satisfied, whereas the full-time employees feel somewhat overqualified and understimulated as our customer center evolves into a specialist functions regarding customer service uh, with less broader cross-company tasks. So I think, you know, there can be... Uh, big differences in agent agent satisfaction. Is that something you found, Rob? Um, I think it does. I've, 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 I've never seen it quite so clear-cut as, 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 um, as that contributed there in terms of the part-time and the full-time, but certainly um, in different role types. So potentially if you look at um, someone who has a sales role over a customer service role or um, a, a person who's working for different types of team managers with different skill sets as well, um, so it can differ and there can be variations, but I think a lot of that comes back to that unified goal and having everyone on the same page with the same goal and aiming to achieve the same thing. Um, and if everyone's geared up to that, then um, everything can be steered towards it. Yeah, it sounds like there's potentially a bit of a, a nutrition problem uh, uh, looming up um, there as well. If, you know, after time, uh, people sort of get a bit... Uh, a bit bored, I guess, uh, coming through. Right, I'm, we're going to dive into a, another poll now. What I would like to do is to look at uh, problems in improving the customer uh, experience and just like to ask what problems do you face in improving customer experience? You can, this is a multiple answer one. So if you'd like to vote on all of those that apply. Uh, so the answers are senior management buy-in, conflicting targets, uh, unhappy agents, uh, you're swamped with calls, or you have technology problems. Now, uh, Francis Carden from OpenSpan, how much of a barrier do you think technology problems uh, is in, in when you're talking in, in uh, contact centers? Um, so, oh, well, obviously for us, you know, technology is, is at the heart of what all of the agents are actually interfacing with. The desktop itself is actually the technology. So, however, you know, back to the uh, the spanner or the wrench, as uh, Rob described. However good those tools are, the desktop um, is really going to lead to how well somebody can do their job. And we talked about a specialist agent. A lot of contact centers are forced down the specialist agent route, which can create that mundane uh, uh, role for the agent. Simply because the technology is so complex, you can't easily create the universal agent where they can come in and actually deal with multiple call types, which keeps the job more interesting and on path. So I actually think it's a, a very key area. Oh, and as we see by this poll, 70% of the, uh, the, the poll here think technology is the um, you know, major problem. 
Yeah, just put the results up on the screen there, and, and by far the largest is is problems with technology. That, that I'd expected it to be high. I was, I was perhaps surprised that it came as uh, as high as that. Surprisingly, senior management buy-in was actually was actually you, you know important, but only a, applied to a third of people. Um, conflicting targets also another um, another challenge. What I'd like to now do is I'd like to drill down in a little bit more detail on problems you face in improving customer experience. And I'd just like to ask the question of you in our audience, what is your biggest problem in improving customer experience? If you'd like to type in your answers into the question box on the right-hand side, uh, down at the bottom, bottom right-hand side, and the question is, what is your biggest problem in improving customer experience? So I'll just give you a little while to type your answers in. So we're, we're getting a couple of uh, the answers uh, coming up now. Uh, Rebecca says her biggest problem is dealing with service level agreements. Uh, Roy says never blame the company for a policy or a decision. You are the company. Uh, Isadora says unmotivated agents. Uh, Julian says that the main issue is client procedures. Uh, Matthew talks about agent empathy. Uh, Christensen talks about uh, bad agent satisfaction. Uh, agent engagement says salary. Uh, says Sally. Uh, consistent consistency in uh, ever-changing information uh, says uh, Brian. We've got an, a wide range flowing in now. Internal processes, senior management buy-in. Not enough empowerment of agents, so too much rigidity of processes. Uh, conflicts between service level and agent agent schedules. That's quite a difficult one to deal with, uh, Rob. Consistency between um, service levels and agent sh schedules. You, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a difficult one because you have to have um, some sort of forecasting, and it's never ever going to be perfect. Forecasting often get quite a a hard ride on these sort of subjects, um, and um, therefore having the right kind of people in order to support them and give them the you know everything we talked about in terms of tools and that. Um, I guess um, I guess the key is is looking to try and find alternative ways of of, of giving people that time if if it's not available. Um, and um, look for you know alternative options to 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 to, to get them online. Maybe using free stuff that they can find online, uh, tools and uh, training courses and things, or um, using uh, time where you've got everyone at the same time in your team meetings, as opposed to one-to-one -one coaching, so that you're getting the same message across to a lot of people at the same time. Um, and probably most importantly, working to build a good relationship with the, the scheduling side of things. Quite often, when um, there's a bit of a them and us situation that can really drive the problems that we're talking about. So if you actually build that relationship, understand each other's side and point of view, you can quite often influence them quite 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 a lot to, uh, to, to to get your side of it and understand where you're coming from instead of just having a blinkered, are we going to be able to answer the calls? I don't care if you want to be off the phone, it doesn't matter, um, uh, opinion. Yeah, we're seeing quite a large conflict here between uh, uh, answers coming back to deal with uh, uh, meeting quality with the volume of calls coming th through. That seems to be a sort of consistent key, uh, theme coming through. Uh, technology is quite a, an interesting one. We're seeing quite a number of things. Getting the right uh, uh, technology, says uh, Carol. Um, the you know technology holding things back. We've got a comment from Kerry who asks, um, if the tools are out of your control, but you get everything right, can you still have satisfied agents? Francis, what's your view on that? If your tools are out of your control, but you get everything else right, can you still have satisfied agents? Yeah, so I guess the, uh, that, might, that might be more related to the fact you're using somebody else's applications or, or applications for which you can't get changed to, to, to um, help in the process is, is one of the reasons that that can have an impact. But what we're going to talk about today is how technology, even if you don't own that technology, there are still things you can do with the technology 
I mean, you don't build the engine in your car, but you can decide how, how well you drive it, how fast you drive it, and you can even go to certain places and have it tuned up so it can perform a lot better. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today um, around where that comes and interfaces uh, at the desktop. And uh, we'll get on to that in just one minute. I think the last theme I'm seeing is just um, you know agent workload uh, issues, not having the volume of staff, says Leah and having delays in answering, the agent receives a disgruntled customer as soon as they pick up the phone, which is challenging. Teresa says agent workload often pre prevents them from providing the best service to customers, but they're often reluctant to go the extra mile due to the perception they will not get the required support from the relevant stakeholders. Agents then up, end up doing the very bare minimum. So that's uh, Don't you, Can I just a, say that sounds like someone's got a unified goal, because if they've got a goal of Will, if you ask the question for all that workload, will it improve the customer experience? And the answer is no, but everyone's bought into achieving that unified goal. Yeah, and I know it I, sounds very simple, but that's the whole point of that. that that's the whole point I was trying to make. Yeah, and I'm certainly seeing, uh, seeing a lot of evidence here of, uh, of not being unified, and hence this, if you like, um, dilemma of trying to meet two conflicting, two conflicting targets. Right, what yeah. we'll do is we're now going to drill down into the link between uh, agent satisfaction and customer experience. I'm going to pass the baton across to Francis Carden from uh, OpenSpan. Francis is uh, dialing in today from the uh, United States, where I think it's 8:30 in the uh, in the morning. So, Francis, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself and uh, put your um, slides up on the screen, which we can see now, that would be great. Great. Okay. And uh, yes. So, so good morning to everybody. It's uh, nice and bright and early here for us. So uh, uh, we're excited to be on the on the call. Um, I'm one of the founders of a company called OpenSpan, where we focus on the desktop. Um, so I, ultimately, it's where the human uh, people and technology meet. Um, so we're looking at how we can impact um, the productivity and thus agent satisfaction by. Um, making the technology they have to interface much more uh, efficient and, uh, and that may be more exciting for the work they have to do day in, day out. Um, the uh, agent satisfaction really is a, is a correlation for me around, um, you know, what is a happy agent and what is an unhappy agent. We can cut straight to the chase, right? You know, somebody comes in and, and, and go home at the end of the day and does their job. Um, are you getting, you see my screen? Can you see it? Yeah, we can see that. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so, so yeah, just making sure. Um, so the um, the correlation for me, if we move on to the next slide, sorry about that. What makes an agent actually unhappy? You know, when they when they when they go home from work at the end of the day, they want you know they want to feel like they've done a good job. Everybody, we all do. If we go into work, um, you know, we don't we don't want to go to work, you know, hoping that we can just just get a job done and go home. It's not a, not a very appealing uh, life for anybody. And the poor lady down there in the bottom left has obviously not had a very good day. Um, there are all sorts of things that make us unhappy through life and in the call center. People stealing the food from the agent in the, from the refrigerator, long commute to work, customers that swear down the phone. Everybody wants to be near a window and get real light. Um, you know, whatever it might be. And, and at the moment, I understand you are all basking in a great heat wave. And, you know, that can make you happy or unhappy, depending upon your outlook on life. Um, depends if you're hot or warm or, uh, you know, hot under the collar. But ultimately, yeah, so about 20, 26 degrees uh, here. And uh, we've got the windows closed to get the best audio quality. So the temperature is starting to rise a bit. All right. Well, at least you're keeping the wasps and the flies out, right? You know, that, that's right. That, that, I mean, you are doing something about it. But for most of these things, there's not a lot of things that, that can actually be done, and I'm not here to help you with any of these things. But if we look at what really makes an agent and happy in terms of the work they have to do in their job, right? So, so and looking at this, obviously, there's a huge correlation to technology, which is what I'm here to talk about. So the desktops themselves, whether you have control over them or not, as you talked you, you talked about earlier, the specialist agent as well. They're very complex. You know, you've got to remember, and I noticed one of the other um, elements was just, you know, the, the things that change all the time. You know, the product mixes, the upsell and cross-sell. You've got to remember, you know, somebody may change the rules on somebody in the morning. Um, and, and they've got to remember all throughout the day that that new rule is applied or, or you know, and, and at the end of every call, you've been, the agents have been asked to annotate everything they just did on the call. You know, it's just, it's, I'll get it done, but I've got to get on to the next call because, you know, I'm being measured by that. 
you know, workflows are complex, they're covering many applications, the training is often indicative of, of how difficult it is for an agent to do their job. Give a, give a you know, back to Rob's example, you know, give a, a, you know, a mechanic a spanner and he can just, he's all he's got to do is undo the nut or do the nut back up. Here it's very complex, it's not like that, there are multiple tool, tools involved. And so how is it possible for an agent to focus on the customer and just make them happy if they themselves can't do their job well and therefore they themselves can't be happy? So these are all, you know, ultimately create an unhappy agent that has an impact on how they service the customer and it gets very difficult to do. However, and I know a lot of people raise a lot of these points directly and indirectly with their, with their responses to your question. There is something that can be done about these things and we're going to talk about that today and, and hopefully you're going to leave here with some real use case samples where some of the things you thought could not be solved can really be solved quite quickly using technology today. So I talk about the human, the call center agent and what they have to do. What is the call center agent good at? Let's focus on that first. Right, it's real simple. You, you know this, you, you, you work with them every day. Hopefully answering the phone, listening to the caller, showing rapport and empathy, perhaps if they are having a frustrating day themselves and, and have, having a problem. Thinking on their feet sometimes, it's not cut and dry, oh yeah, well if I do this and give you a credit, everybody's going to be happy. Well that's not, that's, that's going against your business objectives, might make the customer happy, but the agent can, can be be quite deterministic as to when to use those kind of things because they can think on their feet. They know when to escalate something. They do ultimately, given the right tools, know how to solve things. And it can be very satisfying to do that. They're good at following up. If, again, you give them the time to follow up. If you give them the time to do the notes before they take the next call, they'll do a good job of taking notes. And obviously they're good at human discretion. Now some people on the call today may say we don't want any human discretion in Loop. You know, if we want somebody doing a mortgage application, there's not a lot of discretion involved. Well, you've got to give humans some level of discretion in, 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 in the way they work, not necessarily in the process. Um, and all of these things are what humans and agents are good at. Okay? And, and if we give them the opportunity to be good at these things, we'll end up with much happier and therefore more satisfied agent. No doubt about it. I don't think we'll get anybody disagreeing. Of course, we're going to come to the, how is that even possible? But firstly, let's look at what the computer is good at as well. Let's make this a fair, fair race, right? The technology they use is actually really good. Whether it's good right now, it has the ability to be really good. Um, it can multitask. Now, when you put a human in front of a desktop with a keyboard and a mouse, they can't have two keyboards. They might, you might be able to give them two screens and try to make them more but they can't have two keyboards and three mice and five keyboards. They can only do one thing at once, but the computer can actually go and look for information in the background, what we call multitasking. So when a call comes in, you could go have an agent go look at four pieces of information to do a verification or to work out how much money they owe on an account, but, but an agent can only do each of those steps one at a time. But if in the background you have the computer to go do those things at the same time, it can do them in the same time and therefore much faster. Um, often the computer is really good at the tedious stuff. The tedious work is where you don't want any human discretion. There might be 23 clicks and 455 copy and paste involved in a process. That's really tedious. No agent likes doing it. But the computer is not going to complain. If you teach the computer to do that, it ends up being a much more powerful story. A computer rarely makes mistakes. It doesn't never make mistakes. We'll always, uh, we'll, we'll, I, I threw the rarely in there because I think we're all realists. It remembers everything. You know, whereas an agent has to five minutes after the call remember what they did five minutes earlier, the computer can easily remember that. You've just got to remember, you've got to, just got to teach it first. Um, the, the, the computer, we all, we all have access to PDAs or smartphones or, you know, an, I, an iPad or a, um, a tablet or something. The UIs are great. The computer you're looking at now can deliver fantastic UIs. But we don't always deliver those great UIs to the agent to make it easy to do their job. And the computer can also assist the human at the right time. Instead, I'll give you a cross-sell, upsell example. You train an agent to go and look at five screens to determine whether to upsell the customer on something or whether to apply a particular rule. Why doesn't the computer go off and actually look at those five rules why the agent's working on something else? And at the right time, the computer tells the agent, this is the perfect offer given the situation and the prospect for this customer. It's crazy to have humans do the things they're not great at or that makes them unhappy because they're tedious. So those are the what the human's good at, what the computer's good at. 
So at this point, I want to just turn it over to, to a quick poll here, over to John T for this poll, to actually um, start leading into why it's important on, on how we actually use technology to make agents perform better. John T? Okay, yeah, so we're going to look at how long it takes an agent to become a top performer. I've never done a poll like this before, so be fascinated to see the answers. The answers are uh, a single answer, one month, up to one month, up to three months, up to six months, uh, up to a year, uh, or up to two years. We don't have a, a never box on here. So how long does it take uh, an agent from when they walk in the door to become a top performer? Francis, you, you got any ideas what you think might come out? I think this one will actually be quite spread. It depends upon the complexity, but judging by the questions you've got earlier, I'm expecting it to be a year or above. Um, you know, people were pointing to technology as as, as a main area of uh, the complexity for agent satisfaction. So in that case, I'm going to make a bet that at most will be a year or above. Okay. Well, let's have uh, let's have a look. Um, so it's certainly a, a large proportion. Uh, is a year and above. Uh, that's uh, 27 plus 5 is 32 percent, taking longer than a year. Um, the majority are talking about six months to get someone up to being a, a top performer. Surprising, there's a very small uh, section of the audience, one or two, think you can get top performer within a month. I'm guessing that must be a probably quite a simple uh, arrangement. So it looks like the bulk is sort of around six months to uh, well, between three three months at the minimum up to about a a, a year uh, is the is the spread. So quite a quite a while, I would uh, say on that. So, uh, Francis, just pass the uh, baton to you, and uh, if you'd like to uh, look through. So, yeah, quite a quite a quite a spread there. Yeah, great. And and I think that that was interesting because I think that you know I often also look at this and I'm not sure if when we when we ask the question we we we, we highlight the point that you know there's obviously a lot of attrition. How many agents do we have to train and get through to get to even the right agent that gets to be a top performer? Um, and you know we see a lot of that is because you know I, I always say go back and look at how long it takes to train somebody to do their job to become a top performer because if you could reduce the amount of time by half or even even more than that, then that means you've simplified the processes. And most organizations where they have much faster training programs, it tends to be because they have simpler, tech, uh, better technology, and better technology will lead to more satisfaction, uh, more satisfied act, uh, agents as well. So, okay, so um, moving on. So now we've talked about the computer and the human and how well they perform. Let us introduce this technology I've been talking about. What is desktop automation, okay? Well, it's a technology you may or may not be familiar with, but ultimately it's running in a lot of organizations, large call centers around the globe. But it automates the tedious and mundane desktop tasks primarily so that agents can just focus on their time with the customer. I don't want an agent having to do 55 clicks, copy and paste, where that is the same process over and over and over again just to get the two bits of data they need to help the customer. The computer is better off doing that. Now, I don't want to leave people with the impression we're going to replace all these humans with these robots. Far from it. It's, it's using the, the automation to do the work that's repetitive and requires no human discretion so that the agent just can focus on the key element um, of doing their job. And we find time and time again organizations, in fact, call center agents fighting to, to have desktop automation faster than their, their colleagues because they can actually do a better job. So as soon as they see it come in introduced to their organization, there's often a fight going on across the call centers to get it uh, uh, in their organization. So what is it? Um, well, firstly, let's describe desktop automation as accelerating the positive agent experience because that's what we're here to talk about. What does that really mean? It optimizes the agent's activity, the things they do, so that they can focus on the customer. There's a faster track to those top agents that we just talked about. So instead of it taking a year to become a top performer, often our customers see that this is, or, or users of desktop automation, will see that that's reduced by uh, up to half um, quite easily because the processes have got much simpler. Um, we talked a little bit about the specialist call centers because the, the processes are complex. We get more organizations able to implement a universal agent to take more call types because the complexities of those different um, call types um, are dramatically reduced, enabling that to actually happen. Agents are delivering more successful calls. Customer SAT scores are impacted dramatically here. 
because if the, we all know ultimately if you get to a happier agent that's obviously because they're doing being more satisfying to the customer and we do see a dramatic improvement in customer satisfaction scores. Uh, we'll talk about this as well but desktop automation is used by some of the world's largest call centers um, you know there there is over well there's millions of uh, organizations uh, uh, I should say uh, call center agents using it today and it really is a game changer for what we're talking about today about agent satisfaction. It truly saves time and money so there's a knock-on effect of course if we're going to make things easier and simpler the time and money is going to come by it's just making things faster. So we talked about how long somebody's forced to be on a call an agent's forced to be on a call because if it takes seven minutes to get through the processes to give the customer what they want and you're going to reduce that to six minutes or four minutes or three minutes through desktop automation, this obviously going to um, have a dramatic impact on, on, on a lot of things in terms of the, the cost of the business. Um, I always think of this, we, we spend our time training the human, but with desktop automation you're actually training the computer first. You're training the computer to do the repetitive, tedious stuff, and then the agent can just do the bits pieces in between that's important to interact with the customer. It can provide better views. So if I'm working on a call, a customer has called in about a bill inquiry for the bill three months ago, let's make it so that one click of a button brings up the bill from three months ago. They shouldn't have to go to the billing system, scroll down for a date, work out what that date was and whether that was a paid bill. All of that should be in view, you know, based upon the context of the call. And that's something that desktop automation also delivers. Um, human error almost goes out the window because if you've got the automation of those tedious points, uh, um, obviously there's no, no opportunity for error there. Um, as I said uh, at the beginning as well, it automates almost everything except the human discretion. So the agent can truly focus on the customer. So desktop automation really has a dramatic play. And I know some of you who may be new to desktop automation may not be realizing that this is a technology that can be implemented very, very quickly. Um, because most organizations are looking for quick payback today. They won't invest, you know, you saw, oh, it's difficult to get management buy-in that we talked about earlier without getting customers, if you like, without being able to provide a payback very, very quickly. And this is really what um, uh, 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 desktop automation is about. As an example here on a screen, um, most organizations, uh, a poll was done recently for um, how much benefit of these three key levels for desktop automation was achieved. In the call center, it was 19% was the average productivity gain out of this. And that stems from taking over these tasks, doing things faster that leads ultimately to, to more agent satisfaction that ultimately leads to better customer satisfaction. And the back office is even greater. Now you're not on the phone, but you're doing a lot more tasks. It's, it's you know, so often a lot of the front, you know, not getting that first call resolution out of the way often leads to some back office tasks as well. So there's a dramatic impact there. But even when a task doesn't get to the back office, there's no uh, individual involved in doing that. But again, desktop automation can play a major role there as well. So on average, 21% uh, in the first year in terms of productivity gain by looking at desktop automation-like solutions. Um, so this is it. Desktop automation ultimately results in happy agents, which must result in satisfied agents. If I use that, they're able to sell more if they're on an upsell commission because there's more time. You know, you may not want to reduce the handling time. I've actually had customers tell me they don't want to reduce the handling time. Well, that's not a reason to keep all these, you know, have the agent doing the tedious work. Have the computer do the work and decide what you want to do with that two or three minutes of savings. Spend more time with the customer to upsell more or just have to build a better rapport with the customer if you're in, say, banking, finance, or, 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 or wealth management. Less time in training, less attrition, more successful outcome, definitely the scorecards. We're often measuring our, you know, what this is another point that came through, we're often measuring our agents and things that they have no control over. Why measuring, you know, the scorecards, um, you know, and also the um, the cost stat scores, you know, they're impacted by how long an agent's on the phone and how frustrating it can get through, through the work they have to do. They, they can't control that. Now you can. You can make their job so much easier they tr the impact on the scorecards really does have an impact on, on um, uh, you know, based upon those outcomes of the calls. Less frustration, less attrition, less penalties because there's less mistakes and ultimately less stress and a much, you know, so, so there's a, a, a much better outcome at the end of the day when the agent goes home. Final comment, really, for the call center leader. This is actually a quote um, I found recently, and this really sums up agent satisfaction and why it's important. Satisfied employees are actually more productive, innovative, and loyal. Um, and ultimately, employee satisfaction plays a strong role 
ultimately in predicting profitability and organizational effectiveness. And that's what the business leaders care about. So that's my uh, slide presentation over. Um, John, T, back to you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Francis. And if people want to uh, explore more of your technology, what do they need to, to do? Do they need to just get in contact with you? or? Yeah, they can just go to openspan.com. We have a, a, a you know a, a good good interface to drive people based upon what they're looking for, what type of call center they are, and uh, you know lead them in the right direction. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're now into. Thank you very much for that, uh, Francis. We're now into the uh, part of the webinar where you get a chance to uh, put in your top tips to improve agent satisfaction or uh, customer experience. And there's a chance to win a bottle of champagne. The odds on this are generally much higher than uh, in winning the uh, national lottery. I think we've had uh, uh, about a dozen tips so far, so uh, quite uh, uh, quite good chances overall. So let's look at the uh, uh, first of the tips. Um, so uh, uh, Anamik says uh, agent empowerment improves the improves customer customer satisfaction. And of, of course, that uh, uh, ties in with agent satisfaction. So it looks like uh, Anamik certainly uh, believes that we, there is a critical link between agent satisfaction and the customer experience. Very encouraging. And um, let's have a look. To improve, Kerry says to improve customer experience, allow agents to self-score their calls and listen to and score their manager uh, their managers' calls. It's quite interesting. <laughs> scoring your managers' calls empowering them to see what is good service and share best practice. Happy agents equal happy customers. Certainly, uh, Francis, I think there's a very strong connection here between happy agents and happy happy customers. I think self-scoring is very interesting. Scoring your agents, your manager's scores could be quite interesting too. Very. Yeah, I think that's quite a, quite a strong link there. So I'd be... Uh, Fascinated to see what the outcome of, of uh, scoring managers' calls are. So, Kerry, if you wanted to just drop a a, a link on, a, a note on that, that would be uh, be fascinating. Sandeep says, I think if agents are, are not being managed properly, regardless of their potential, they could lose focus and mindset, which would have an adverse effect on customer experience. So, it all comes down to team team management. I think, Rob, that was one of the areas that you you discuss is is really quite critical. Team leadership, though, let's move away from management. It's a horrible word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, certainly yeah, getting the, the leadership levels, levels right. Uh, Rebecca says, uh, all levels of staff need to understand or recognize who their customers are, whether internal or external, before removing barriers and work towards their, work towards their goal. Um, and uh, Teresa says, take full ownership of the customer's problems and put yourself in their shoes while trying to resolve their concern. This will ensure that you go the extra extra mile for the for the customer. Francis, we had some feedback earlier saying that the danger is if, if agents feel overloaded, they don't feel that, that they, they, they can necessarily go the extra mile, particularly if they swamp with calls. You've got any advice on that? Yeah, I think that's 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 the truth of it. I mean, you know, if they're I mean, I always say, look over the shoulder of an agent, and, and Rob said this earlier, but mine's for a different reason. Just just walk around and just sit there and watch. We, we look at the calls in terms of the call quality and things like that, but just look at what they actually do when they interface with the technology. And, you know, I actually had a, a call center agent once tell me that, that they had to put me on hold because they had to go print off my information because there was too much information to print on what put on one screen. Uh, and and that was kind of like it was easier to print it off and have it in front of them on paper so they could help me. That's a real technology issue, and so I think that that's the connection. Take that problem away from the agent by simplifying the agent desktop, and the agent can truly get to do their job, and that's when the game changing really starts to occur. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I certainly see. Can I put you on hold? Uh, one of the biggest single reasons for that is 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 technology related. And that represents, I think, quite a large degree of uh, what is uh, we normally call as talk time, but actually it's not talk time. It's it's sort of, if you like, wasted time overall. So let's have a, a look. Uh, Kerry says, don't target for length of call, target for customer satisfaction. I've certainly seen lots of call centers where uh, you, know, you rush people off the phone rather than solving the uh, solving the problem. Um, that's, that's, so, that's, 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 that's to give him. 
I'm sorry, that's back to give you metrics, you know, that they can't have any impact on. If it's going to take eight minutes to do the call because it's taking eight minutes through technology, it's nothing you can do about it, and it's, and it's, and it's sad, for sure. Yeah. Never blame the company for a policy or a decision. You are the company. And um, Brian's an interesting one here. Listen to your agents. Meet frequently with them as a group and individually. I think that this is really a, a sort of key part of uh, leadership. Uh, Rob, particularly the, the higher up the, the ladder you go, that does tend to be one of the things that often gets missed. It's, it's too, it is. It's too easy to get and um, to lose track of the, the point of contact. You know, those agents are the people who touch the customers every day, so you've got to touch those agents every day uh, and interact with those agents every day so that you know you know what they're going through and what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good. And really good that. Very much tied in with your uh, alignment, Rob. One of the reasons why employees fail to do what's expected of them, they're not told what's expected of them. Be clear in your expectations. Even before they accept the job, it's one of the ways to make sure agents aren't disappointed. Uh, Vivian thinks we should involve agents in improvement initiatives, certainly very oh, important, yeah. and ask them for tips on how to improve their performance and satisfaction. Uh, Sarah says, my top tip for agent satisfaction is to truly actively listen to your agents. They're the ones doing the, the job. They know better than anyone else how to improve that. Get them involved and it will change everything. Certainly uh, very key there. Take time to develop a personal relationship with individuals. Let them know you care about them as people, not just a number at a desk. Agents who are cared about want to, want to do well. Um, uh, I think we've covered that one already. And top performing agents get time off the phones and their calls are handled by team leaders and op ma ops managers in that time. This Francis is another example here of passing, passing, passing things back up the chain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, select an agent on a daily basis to be the leader of the team for one day. Make agents very happy and responsible. Certainly, a very interesting one. And uh, ask the agents to identify the barriers to delivering excellent customer service and how these can be re removed. These are the people who are closest to the customer and know what the barriers we're put, putting in place. Look for volunteers within the agent population and drive this. I think both Francis and Rob, you know, barriers are certainly uh, one, of the, one of the key things, whether it's process or whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's technology. I think there's certainly a key uh, key role to be done with that. Uh, we've got a load more tips that we uh, unfortunately can't uh, uh, can't get to, to today. So um, we're just about out of time. But 